This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I am Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and this show is Finding Respect in the Chaos. Today I'm here with Catherine I. Cow, and she has an important story. She lost her son to domestic violence. Domestic violence often strikes the children. We call them collateral damage, and that's the name of the show today, collateral damage, because so often we forget that the children become victims from the just being exposed to watching that kind of behavior in their relationships at home so that they end up growing up to perpetuate the problem to the extreme version of having a child lose his life. Today I'm here with Catherine. Catherine, welcome to the show. And Thank I, you for having can me. Can I call you Cat? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I want to say first off that you're so brave for coming out and sharing your story. And I really admire your courage for being able to come out in hopes that you can maybe help somebody that's in the situation you were in so that the outcome is a little different. Why don't you give us a little background of, of your story and, and of grief? Okay, Cynthia, well, thank you for having me. On June 13th of 2017, Reef was three months shy of his eighth birthday, and he was stabbed to death by his father, who then was addicted to ice. And then the father stabbed himself and hung himself. And unfortunately, Reef should have been in Greece with me. But before I talk about his death, I want to talk about his life because he really was an incredible kid. Right. So just to share a little bit about Reef, um, he was actually a CEO of his own company, Reef, Reef Kids 808. Wow. Since he was three, and he sold fish hats, and they sell out at Sea Life Park. I just dropped off an order on Friday. I think we so have a still picture of the them. fish hats, don't we have a picture of those? Exactly. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> and that's I, Reef in the middle. In the middle, yeah. And he sponsored various events. That was a preschool outing. He sponsored um, the Haliva Menehune contest, surf contest. And he sold the hats at Bishop Museum. Wow. There was a shark hat, a pink hat, and then the one that you saw. Wow. And so he was a little entrepreneur. At seven years old, that's remarkable. Uh, and he started at three. Wow. So, wow. So, <laughs> and he's, he was actually, uh, his, he's the great nephew of Clyde I. Cow and Eddie I. Cow. Uh -huh. And um, my husband was um, a surfer, a surf instructor. A certified lifeguard, and then I was um, actually number one in the nation in swimming. Oh my goodness! And and so uh, he was a swimmer then, he right? Came, so he he came out he came out surfing as soon as he could walk. Wow! Yeah. So and then um, I was a ski instructor, so he could basically ski. Oh my god! He learned to ski when he was two, and then wow. by four, five, six, seven, he was snowboarding. Oh my goodness! I think we can go. We I think we have some pictures of him swimming, don't mm -hmm. we? I and and he that. was on um, both Splash Aquatics and Manoa Aquatics because he did surf at such a young age that he, there he is swimming. Oh, you can't see that yeah. one too. I think we have one of him on the blocks. That I love that yeah, one. So, so He's just ready to take off. That's Manoa Aquatics, and uh, like I said, because he could surf at such a young age, and he started competing in surfing. Then we had to, there, there's a picture at the Puffer Fish surf contest in Makaha. Wow. And the, the waves actually overhead. But because he was surfing at such a young age, we had to get him into swimming. So by the time he was uh, six, seven, he was swimming two and a half hours every day, two five days a week. Hours a day? Two and a half hours a day with the big kids. Wow. With the big kids. Competitive swimming. Oh my goodness! I'm a swimmer, so I know what that's like. I mean, yeah. I swim an hour. And he was just the little guy. <laughs> can imagine being having a little guy swim that far. Wow. Yeah. So, and he would get mad if I would, would bring him even a minute late to practice. He was so dedicated. So. Wow. 
So, um, and he also received a full scholarship to the Honolulu Museum of Art School. Wow. And he had a full portfolio. He was an artist and a musician. He played guitar. And wow. so it's like, is there anything he didn't do or couldn't do? That seems no, like he maybe skateboarded, not. snowboarded. I think we have a picture of all the oh, look all of his trophies. Yeah, there's, there's his wow. swimming ribbons and his surf trophies. Wow. And that one, that picture of him in the middle right there, I think he's probably four, three or four. For any one. Oh, and there that, is a little was, snowboarder. Look at how yeah. deep. How old was he there? Probably three. Three Aww, or four? He's Three? so adorable. Yeah, so any, anything, any kind of board, he tried to write it. <laughs> right there. So you can see skateboard, snowboard, Aww. and surfing. Wow. But he was already competing in surfing and swimming That's by the time amazing. he was five, I think. So he was just an incredible kid, and he loved school. He went to Noalani School. And he loved math and science, and uh, he loved computers. You know all the kids nowadays. Yeah, right. So he was just he's an amazing, well-mannered. He, he could talk to anybody. That's um, when he went to the Honolulu Museum of Art School. Right. That was his first day of school, actually. Wow. And they, he would literally do art from 8 to 3, 8 a.m. to 3. Oh my God! The whole summer. So what a great life! Yeah, uh, and, but the he kind of summer school every kid wants, right? Yeah, <laughs> and he loved Noalani, and they, that was just the best school, and and yeah, he loved his teachers. So right. he had a bright, bright future, mm. and unfortunately, it was cut short. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what happened and what maybe some of the events that led up to it? Well, I had been married um, to my husband since 2009, and this happened um, October, the event happened October 23rd, 2016, so we had been together, you know, eight years. Yeah. And um, my husband had always had kind of an anger issue, anger management issue. Right. And... Um, he was physically violent to me, but in 2014, he had an altercation, and he just, I mean, it, t it changed him, and he quit. Uh, he wasn't violent anymore, and because um, I was about ready to get a divorce. Every time he, something happened, I would say, I'm going to get a divorce, and, um, and, he, and it just stopped. So from 2014 until 2016, he was, he was, it seemed like he was getting better, and, and yeah. none of his anger, the, the hard part for me was none of his anger was ever um, directed at he, his children. It, besides Reef, he had a, another stepson and a, a daughter. And, I mean, I had a stepson. It was his uh, son. Okay. But, um, so the hard part for me was I wanted to leave him, but he had such a close relationship with... Um, with Reef and his other children, that that was such a redeeming quality. Right. And it was hard. Be I didn't want to take Reef away from his father. Right. So, um, and I think a lot of women are in that situation. So right. the, the abuse continues. And, right. um, and then, like I said, the abuse for me quit, or it stopped. Wow. So, but then um, in 2017, I mean, 2016, um, he got a job, my husband got a job at um, Island Club and Spa, and there was a gentleman that my husband told me was dealing ice, and my husband became addicted to ice. It doesn't take long, you know? No. And it's such a destructive drug that just changes people so mm -hmm. radically. So radically. And I had no, I didn't even know that he was um, addicted to ice. I, I mean, he was becoming more and more erratic his behavior and, and right. again, but he didn't direct any of that to my son. And he, um, and he, he emotionally, it was starting to be, he was starting to become abusive again. Right. But, um, and then on October 23rd, he literally destroyed our whole house. And oh my gosh, I don't know if this picture can, if it can show on the camera, if it shows up. Um, so this was actually, 
Reef's room. Oh my gosh, that is your son's room? So and he did that I too? don't know if you can see, but um, the, this is all the hats and stuff those from are, his. Oh, those are the the inventory business. of his hats, and then Reef, and his boards his here, all of his competitive surfboards. surfboards. Oh, oh, and my, my husband gosh. broke all of his surfboards, maybe like eight to ten surfboards. Oh, and then um. The whole house was destroyed. Our, my husband took a baseball bat to the to the large screen TV, took a knife and and cut up our sectional sofa and literally the every uh, we had a stairwell that was lined with pictures. All the glass was just broken everywhere. Oh my gosh! And so that and then um, Gerald had had grabbed me and I had bruises, etc. Mm -hmm. And so um, Reef Reef was not in the room at that time, but. Uh, when the police came, the police actually told me not to file or press charges and not to file a restraining order. Did they give you a reason? Did they even? They, they did. They said that it would be if, uh, like, if my husband violated the restraining order, then each violation would we would have to go to court and et cetera, et cetera, and um, and for for. They, they didn't really give a reason. They just said it would, you know, it would be why too don't much you trouble. try to work it out? Or, oh, my and, goodness. Was this the first time the police had come, or had the police no, been there before? They had been there before. My husband was very loud, and, and like I said, he did have an anger issue, and he right. did yell a lot, so the neighbors would call the police and, right. and from the multiple houses that we had lived in. Um, okay. So this wasn't the first time, but this was the first time that... I wanted to press charges, and they dissuaded me. And then um, my friend actually came over to get Reef, you know, to take him to out take of him this, away from this, this yeah, situation. Right. And she was an advo advocate for the military for domestic violence. Oh, okay. So she, when she got to the house, she said, "Cat, absolutely press charges and absolutely, and yeah. get a restraining order right away." Right. So that's what I did. Good for you. Wow. So. Unfortunately, uh, if if the one thing that I've learned out of this um, is right away, if anybody is in that situation, you can call DVAC, right, and Domestic Violence Action Center, and they have resources to help you. Right. And it's so important to call them and not be on your own. There's no reason to be on your own through this. Right. And if it is a domestic violence situation, there's actually an advocate that will come out with the police. That's what I just and heard. I, I had interviewed a gal um, in the first episode mm -hmm. uh, for this show, and that's what she was saying, is that they now have an advocate that goes out to the site mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. of the, um, the situation, the abuse, mm -hmm. when it's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, so there can be somebody right there, and they will stay with you mm -hmm. the whole way through, even all the way straight through to a lawyer. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't my experience you didn't of get it. The lawyer, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's what I would like to tell. Um, I think it is so important in this situation if you have, if you're in a domestic violence situation, and then there's um, sub substance abuse involved and violence right. involved then right away you need to, again, call Domestic Violence Action Center, and they will provide an attorney. Right. And it, they have a scale, so if you don't have a lot of money, or depending on your, your right. wages, et cetera, they will, they will subsidize, you know. Oh, wow, so that you can for sure costs. get that lawyer. Yes. Right. And well, that's huge, because when oh. I went to get the TRO, I didn't include Reef on the TRO. And what I'm pushing for um, with the courts and with anybody that will listen to me, senators, et cetera, is that I believe if there's children involved, if there's domestic violence involved, and if there's substance abuse involved, then right away there should be a TRO, and the child should be on the TRO, and there should be no visitation. I, I totally agree, and I think that we need to talk about that a little bit more, but right now we're just about ready to go to a break, okay. and again, I want to thank you, Kat, for mm -hmm. having the courage to come out here and tell your story, because it's an important story that people need to hear. So we are going to talk more about the different ways that we can maybe change some laws to help victims 
stay safe. So I hope you'll come back. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos, and the title for today's show is Collateral Damage. I'm here talking with Kat Aikau, who has a really important story that everyone needs to hear. And right now, before the break, we had started talking about the different um, things that are in place that actually hurt victims, mm -hmm. shame being the biggest one. It's like society wants to shame victims into silence. It's like we're embarrassed to, to say something. Like when there's domestic violence happening in the home, it's like, well, you don't want to bring shame to the family or whatever. And, and so it kind of keeps quiet. And I think that's why we need to all tell our stories as much as we can. Exactly. I feel the complete opposite. I feel that... that for the victim or survivor of domestic violence, there is no shame, there is no stigma. There should and be, yeah. They should be able to speak out freely. I agree. To anyone that will listen, that's and that's right. what I do because of this, um, the situation that happened. I want to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone again, and there is no shame. There is, you know, it, the only right. shame is for the perpetrators of domestic violence. Right, exactly. Those are the ones that mm -hmm. need to feel the shame, mm -hmm. and for some reason it gets turned around and if you're going no. up against somebody that has money for me when i went through this mm -hmm. whole thing um not to the extent of losing a child but my ex-husband fractured my skull put me in the hospital a couple mm -hmm. of times and the shame was ever for him um he was such a nice guy out in public everybody thought he was such a great person mm -hmm. that at first nobody even would believe that it happened so, and he would say that, nobody's going to believe you. Everybody's going to think it's your fault. And so I just kind of was programmed to fall in line with that. Mm -hmm. And so when I finally got a, a, a TRO, which is a temporary restraining order, mm -hmm. the police told me the same thing. I had the TRO. He violated the TRO. I called him. He came over, put his gun to my head. And, and they caught him with the gun and everything. And they told me... I shouldn't press charges. And I was like, no way, I've got to. By that point, I was finally at a place where I was strong enough to press mm -hmm. the charges. And that was when I finally stood up and said no more. And that's the reason that we have to speak up as women, that's as right. mothers. Right. Because we have to be the voice for all the people who are hearing what you heard. Because right. I don't believe at all that I'm not going to be heard now. I'm going to be heard. Good for you. Absolutely. I'm, I'm honored that I get a chance to give you this platform here today to share your story because, like, it's such an important story. So for, for me, what happened was originally with the police, they said, don't press charges, don't file the TRO. So I did press charges, and I did file the TRO, but I did not put reef on, and there was violent substance abuse or violence from the substance abuse right uh in this situation so absolutely again if i would have called dvac gotten an attorney and the attorney would have gone to the tro hearing with me and if somebody had like hopefully what i'm doing told me get that get your child on the tro and no visitation that's a big thing because they don't automatically put children on a TRO. No. And I think that it should be automatic. 
automatic. I think it should be absolutely automatic. Yes. If you've yes. got evidence that this, that, you know, the man has crossed the line mm -hmm. with violence mm -hmm. and like he destroyed your house, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And if you can find any proof that he's on drugs, mm -hmm. I think it should be automatic, no visitation, mm -hmm. like you say. No visitation. And the problem with, with when I went through the, when I went through the system, the criminal case against my husband for the for the injuries and the destruction kept getting postponed, and there was there was even a, a witness with a video. But because the, they kept postponing it, she quit coming, and they, and oh. they were even calling Reef into the courtroom, and to just to to say that he didn't see anything. If he'd seen something, it would have been a felony. So I'm not sure why they were even trying to bring him in. But he didn't see anything, so it was traumatizing. And I asked the judge, "Does Reef really need to be here just to say he didn't see anything?" Yeah. And and but but besides that, I had um, filed. Uh, I wanted to take Reef to. Right, you were telling I me was, about that. Tell me some more so, about that. So because of the the destruction to the house, it was very traumatic for Reef and I. So I bought a boat because I grew up on a boat, and I thought it would be therapeutic and fun and help him heal. Right. Now, I haven't sailed a boat. I'm, I wasn't the captain. I mean, I've sailed, I grew up sailing, but I haven't sailed the boat as a captain. So I had signed Reef and I up for, um, in Greece, to learn uh, boat safety and, and sailing skills. So you have a really great job, obviously. Yes. To do something like that. Like yes. you. That's yes. wonderful. And so you had I have a very steady job. job. You had the financial yes. means to and take I had care just of him. I bought the boat. I bought the car to, to carry all the stuff for the boat. I'm not a flight risk, but my husband wouldn't sign for the passport. So twice I filed for the to get the passport so I could take Reef and try to heal. Right. And and, and the court wouldn't the court kept postponing wouldn't give me the passport, even oh. though I wasn't a flight risk. And oh, and just no. every, every, the, and then I filed for um, sole custody, and everything kept getting postponed, postponed, postponed. So there was no urgency, and my husband even, even, um, even uh, reported me to CPS. And I, I've never even had more than a speeding ticket. 10 years ago for going 71 on the freeway. I, I mean, I have no history. My, my husband had a long rap sheet, including prior TROs from two or three women. And there was and yet no the court support for held me. held him up, held up his case like that? That's horrible. The, every, the civil case, the criminal case, the, um, he violated the TRO tw twice, but basically, he violated it basically every day. But the two that I reported were serious enough that, right. I mean, they were all serious, but those were, he was claiming, um, you know, abuse of grief. And so, and all of those, there's no urgency in processing these right. or, or protecting the child. Right. And, and they just kept getting be. postponed or, or it was often, you know, postponed, postponed. And if grief should have been in Greece with me. So this, so oh three God. days before I was supposed to come back from Greece, my husband, again, stabbed my son to death, and he never should have had access to him. He shouldn't have been around, is right. And that needs to change. We've got to make changes to our legal system. And you know, when we were, um, when I first met you, was at that, um, the Women's Legislative Caucus a few weeks ago, and legislators are trying to listen, and they They've got to listen because they've got to make the kind of changes that need to happen for kids to stay safer. I, I honestly feel at this point right now that there's no focus in, throughout this system when it comes to domestic violence. There's no focus. The number one focus should be protecting the children. They shouldn't be exposed to any of this. Right. And if it's men, if it's women, you should not be angry at your spouse or hitting them, and especially if you have children, because that negative energy, right. it just seeps right into it their does. everyday life. It does. And so if you, if you don't think that domestic violence is hurting your children, it is. It doesn't matter if it's not directed at them, just being around that whole right. situation and then don't underestimate if somebody is is 
addicted to ice or addicted to crack, don't underestimate how violent it can right. become and how minute. quick in yeah. a minute. In a second, they just flip and change, and you think you know them, and then there's somebody and there's completely resources. different. And there's resources. There are resources. Get, again, get to the Domestic Action Violence Center and get an attorney, because the thing for me, the attorney, what, this process was so slow and drawn out, and I didn't know how to navigate it. And right. that's what the attorney, get an attorney right away again. They will help subsidize. If you can't, if you think you can't afford it, you can. And you need, from the time you, you need to file the, um, you know, fi uh, file the, T the TRO, et cetera, you need to have that attorney because it, it, it's just so much more effective. Right. And the people will be there who, who know what to do. That's exactly right. And you have something coming up, I believe, um, called the Reef Run, right? Why don't you tell us about the Reef Run? We do. Okay, so I'm we excited. We don't have too much time okay. left, but I want okay. to make sure everybody hears about the Reef Run. Okay, so quickly, we are doing, in memory of my son, Reef Icow, the Reef Icow Fun Run yeah. on April 15th. And probably at the Capitol, but we have a um, we have a website set up right now, and it's Reef Run R E E F R U N dot org, and it's very important that you put in the dot org. So Reef Run dot org, or you can put in the full name the Reef I Cow Fun Run dot org. But we're going to raise money for for funds for families in domestic violence who need emergency housing, um, medical costs, utilities paid, bus passes, and legal funds. So we're hoping okay. to raise a lot of funds for that. And there is currently a GoFundMe account. So if you go to GoFundMe and look up Reef Icau, R-E-E-F, and A-I-K-A-U, and you can donate there. And then we will have the registration forms up on the reefrun.org website. Uh, by the end of January. Awesome. I'm it, so proud of it's you. It's going to be a run and amazing. then a finish line celebration. So I'm it's going to so, be a lot of fun. I'm so touched that you're going to make something good come from this. Yes. That's the only way we can turn this kind of stuff around. Right? We have to protect the children. We As do. mothers, we need to protect our children. I love your heart, and can you tell everybody oh. what that is, please? Because I so, think everyone should know that's really um, special. This is the locket that I wear, and it's Reef's ashes. So he wanted to travel the world, and so I take him wherever I, can, wherever I go. He goes with me. That's really beautiful. Whew. Well, I'm sure everyone today needed to get out their Kleenex. I know I did. What a, uh, what a powerful story that is. Well, thank and you I, for letting me share it. I thank you for coming. I feel really honored. And this has been Think Tech Hawaii, finding respect in the chaos. Don't forget the collateral damage. Don't forget the children. We need to change the laws so that we can protect children better than we do now. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you'll come back week after next to see finding respect in the chaos.